we fought defending world champions. We didn't fight for a vacant title with some random contender, top number one guy from some defunct organization who's you know twenty and zero and fought nobody from Timbuktu. You know, we fought real guys who were defending their titles. This whole email champion thing is disgusting. It it really it it bothers me to my core. You have to fight. This is boxing. You have to fight, and the fighters want to fight. <laughs> Welcome to Deep Waters. I am George Jakovic alongside another illustrious panel, the Hall of Famer, analyst, and trainer, Teddy Atlas, the champions, Pauli Malinaji and Chris Algieri. This is Deep Waters today, and we're talking about boxing's bad look. And what are we talking about? We're Ooh. talking about a couple of things that happened last week. You know, guys, if you if you love the sport and if you know it, sometimes you don't really like the sport. And last week, there, there were two instances of things that, that me personally, I, I hate. One was an exhibition fight between Hall of Famer James Tony and Razor Ruddick. That was allowed to take place on Triller. It was a pay-per-view. And the other was Terrence Crawford being stripped of his IBF title. Boots Ennis has been elevated to the champion. And there's a lot to talk about, guys. Um, Teddy, I'll start with you. I'm all for, if a champion doesn't defend his belt, I think they should be stripped. But I think the problem is it's just arbitrary. I mean, um, the Jamal Charlo, Leo Santa Cruz, many, many fighters have been able to hold on to belts for so long without defending them. Chris Algieri, you were stripped of a belt in your career. But Teddy, this arbitrary way that boxing strips its champions, why does it happen? Why is there no consistency, rhyme, or reason? Well, it happens out of convenience for the alphabet organization that is stripping them because like uh paulie can tell you and um what was his name in uh godfather said to michael and godfather too uh it's business it's not personal and yeah uh, what was his name paulie the guy that uh, said that uh, um uh, it was um yeah the goda was the was the actor and Tom told him it's just business. Tom told him. Yeah. 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 And Tom. listen, with these organizations, if they ever need an extra casting for a movie like The Godfather, they can go in there and they can say it, you know, with a lot of confidence and with a lot of practice and a lot of belief because it is always business, you know. Uh, it's not personal. It's about the money. Uh, you know, we have no unilateral conformity in this country. The only cure for it would be a national commission, which is never going to happen probably, although I'm pushing for one now and getting people together to sign a petition. And we are going to Congress. We're going to have an audience with Congress and we're going to give it we're going to give it the best try we can to get conformity, to get unilateral um, rules that can actually be enforced. But to your question, George, it. You know, there has to be, if there's no consistency in anything, then you lose the reliability about whatever that is. Whatever that organization is, that product is, um, you lose credibility. And boxing has lost great credibility because there's no consistency. And you said it right, they pick and choose where, you know, they want to, change the rules. All you need to know is the IBF, it used to be an inside joke in boxing, okay? Everyone used to laugh. They had 12 rules, and then they had a 13th. It was like the small print. You know the small print, George? Mm -hmm. uh, you you got to look at that small print in the contract. Do not sign a contract without looking at that small print. And the small print said, rule number 13. Where'd that come from? Anyway, rule number 13, that the, the president of the IBF, the head guy at the IBF, has, has the right and the power and the ability at any time to forego those previous uh, prior 12 rules and, and make, make an, you know, a decision contrary to those rules uh, and, and just change it up. And that tells you everything. That really does. That that was actually a rule that you had twelve rules and then it said these rules don't count unless I say they count. I can I can undo these rules anytime I want. And as far as being in a courtroom, if we were in a courtroom, because you do have to put evidence to the things I'm saying, and we do that here. 
We put advert. We don't just, we give you opinion, but we also give you things based on facts, on documented facts. Look, look at Charlo. Charlo has been inactive for over two years. Now, look, I know that recently they've been talking about some mental health issues and we're all very sensitive to that. Okay, but two, two years, over two years, and he has not been stripped. Why? I mean, you don't really need the Mason Kreskin and Colombo to get together to figure it out. They, he has a relationship there. Canelo, same thing. Have you ever seen him, you know, sanctioned for anything? No. Same reason he has a re- he brings money in. He has a relationship with that organization. And it shouldn't be, obviously, I'm telling you, Captain Obvious here, it shouldn't be based on relationships. It should be based on right and wrong and establishing rules that are, i say it again, consistent. And there's no consistency in those areas. And again, just go right to the, you know, to this. Follow the money. It's it's business. It ain't personal. Yeah, Paulie, was, um, we're talking was, right and was, wrong. That was Tessio, Teddy. We'll go to play. Oh, you Tessio. got it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Paulie, yeah. right? Yeah, but go. I, I remember the actor's name, Vagoda, but I forgot his, the, the character's name, Tessio. Yeah. Yeah. Pa- Paulie, yeah. want to get your your take? I mean, but but right and wrong in boxing. I mean, it's a it's a there is no right and wrong sometimes. And this is not against Boots Ennis, who we all think is a fantastic fighter. It's he's a great fighter. It's, it's not the fighters. It's, not, it's the system of the sport. It's not about right and wrong. It's about what's convenient in that moment. So the rules are interchangeable, you know, because it's what's convenient uh, one day may not be convenient another day. You know, Bob Aram said, right, I'm, I'm, I said, I'm lying uh, today. I'm, I'm telling the truth. Yesterday I was lying. Well, then <clears throat> the next day he's going to be able to be lying. Yesterday I'm telling the truth today, right? So, <clears throat> so what I'm saying is, you know, it, it's interchangeable as far as what's uh, convenient to follow the money, like Teddy says, you know. And in this c- particular situation, I think uh, – Ennis has been warranting and, and merited a, a, a world title and a world title shot for the longest time, you know? I said yesterday when we had uh, uh, Tim on that I felt like if the right thing had been done from the start, which was to enforce Ennis as the mandatory a couple of years ago, you know, uh, and make Ennis and Spence fight, then you would now have Crawford fighting the winner today, which was a couple of months ago, and you'd still have the undisputed champion. But now... Because they didn't do that, because they had to marinate this Spence and Crawford fight and, 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 and lock the door, lock Ennis out the door. Now, when Ennis is ready to fight for it, he's, no, he's, no, he's not representing enough money for a guy of the, of the caliber of, of, of Crawford business-wise to, to fight him. So now Crawford says, well, I don't need to fight Ennis. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass on this. And now all of a sudden the IBF, which should have stripped, either stripped or forced Spence to fight Ennis, now is stripping uh, Crawford. So it's obviously all about the the uh, uh, relationships built, you know, the, the connections built. Again, Teddy was talking about this as well. And, and that's the whole thing here. If you would have got Ennis a world title or a world title shot a couple of years ago, by now he'd be defending or fighting big names in the sport so that now we still would not have an undisputed welterweight champion, but Crawford versus Ennis would be in demand to close out the undisputed title because uh, Crawford would have already took Spence's belt and Ennis would still have the IBF title. So, so you'd still be able to do this if you'd done it right. But now, because he didn't do it right, you have all kinds of problems where Crawford doesn't make enough money fighting Ennis and Ennis is too risky uh, w- w- for the reward that he brings, even if you beat him. Um, and uh, Ennis also, you know, is, is sitting here despite the fact that he rightfully and justifiably deserves a title and a title shot, now we're sort of here as the bad guy because we, we, we got Crawford stripped. Uh, but honestly, you got to do things right from the start, not, not as you go along. Chris, before you start, I just want to make sure everyone knows to download the app. Click on the link in the description. You get talk like this every day. Chris, uh, this is something I know personal with you because we've talked about it many times for people that don't know. You were a champion at 140, and your belt was stripped because you moved up to 147 to fight Manny Pacquiao. It was arbitrarily stripped. So I know you have feelings on this situation, too. Yeah, um, I'm just going to preface this. I made the mistake of watching the news this morning. So I'm going to talk a little bit of from a government perspective today. So, Teddy, what you were describing is the definition of tyranny. 
It's unjust mm -hmm. and oppressive government control. So the hands that be do whatever they want. They can change their mind. Their contracts don't matter to them. The guys who are in control, they can they can keep this guy can keep his title. We're going to strip this guy. Uh, this guy's my friend. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. It, th there there is no oversight. Not there's no control. Absolute power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. And that's that's exactly what these governing bodies are able to do because there is there is no no one to to come after them. There is no one to oversee what they're doing. So they do whatever they want. As <laughs> listen, that's that's what that's what that quote means. Um, and then, Paulie, what you mentioned, that's that's the trickle down effect and how it affects the guys that we're not highlighting at the moment. Yeah, we're talking about Spence and, and Crawford. And yeah, we want this fight to happen. But then the guys like Ennis, the guys who are on the boots, uh, have boots on the ground and are working and trying to get their profile raised are, are left out and they're closed out. Like you said, the door is shut behind them. So it turns into who can lobby the government to get them to, the, the, you know, who can pat them on the back and slide them the slide them the underhanded table, whatever it is that they need so they can go out there and just take care of their friends. Because that's essentially what it comes down to. That's what's going on in the government. That's what's going on, uh, you know, with, with, with politics and in, in boxing. People look out for certain people because one, it puts it puts money in there. Well, it always goes back. Like you said follow the money. It always goes back to putting money in their pocket. Um, so yeah, this this it's not only unjust for the fighters themselves. It hurts the sport. It hurts the integrity. And those are those, that's a that's a, a, a word that in the ring in the gym, integrity is one of the most important things that 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 a boxing highlights. But outside of it, in the rooms where the, the, the deals get cut, in, in the rooms where the contracts get signed, uh, you know, at, over the dinners when these deals are made, there's no integrity. It's, it's all about lining your pockets and taking care of, of your guy. And it hurts the sport because the, the fans who don't know what's going on, who don't have the inside track, who've never been in on any of those meetings, who've never looked at a boxing contract, are looking at this like, hey, what's going on? This, is, this doesn't seem right. It's confusing, which isn't good for a fan base either, especially in a sport like boxing, which is so nuanced and, and, and layered, that we're, we're hurting our fan base because they're confused about who should be fighting, who, who's the champion. And when it seems unfair, people lose interest. And I, I think that, like you said, George, at the top, we love boxing, but man, boxing is, is a great job of giving itself black eyes. And I think this is just another, another place where, where that's the case. I'm going to jump off for one thing you just finished with. The late great, and you said it perfectly, the late great Bert Sugar um, once said that boxing has once again given itself another black eye, but the problem is it has no more eyes to blacken. Mm -hmm. It is the cyclops of the sport, uh, of the sporting world. And you know what? Unfortunately, that um, <laughs> that that difficult quote about a sport that we all love is uh, right on the money. And as you were saying about integrity, you can also throw in the word with the fans that it really does disrupt and it does deteriorate from. And that's the word credibility. The, the credibility of the sport goes down the toilet. I'm sorry. There's a reason why years ago, baseball, they got a commission. They jumped on top of with Pete Rose, which, you know, I think it's wrong. I think Pete Rose should be in the Hall of Fame. But that aside, they jumped on top of that and other such things immediately when there was any talk at all about gambling. Why? Because the credibility of the sport, the brand, would be lost if they didn't. And they understood how important and how powerful that was. And But there's nobody in boxing. Everybody's on their own. Everyone's out there making their own. There's there's no, like I said, no unilateral conformity, no one place to go to. And and they, they the two of them just said it perfectly. Where are you going to go? <laughs> where, where are you going to go? Go see, you know, the, the wise guys would say in the street, go see who you got to see. <laughs> go, go see who you got to see. Who? who? Well, That's Chris, problem. Chris, Chris and Pauly, um, I want to talk about another disturbing trend in the sport. Chris, Paulie, you guys won your belts in the ring. You won, When you became champ, champion, you won it in the ring. There's a disturbing trend now. Tim Zhu, uh, Devin Haney, and now Boots Ennis. And again, this isn't a knock on the fighters. Fighters are given titles 
without earning them. When I was young and, and following the sport, Kenny Norton became WBC heavyweight champion of the world. He was handed a belt. He never earned it in the ring. It seems to be becoming the norm now, Pauly. And I think it's not a good thing for boxing. I'm curious what you two think. I mean, I, 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 I'd rather see guys fighting for the title in the ring. Um, there used to be a sort of a rule for the interim title. Like, and, and it goes back to, I remember, the, 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 the main memory I have of this is when uh, Riddick Bull threw the WBC title in the trash can. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, Lennox was, able, was awarded the title. And that was basically, when you became an interim champion at the time, the, it meant the champion had six months to fight you. So you became the interim champion in a fight that was separate already. But the, the main world champion had six months to fight you. And if he didn't, you would be elevated to full champion, you know? And that, quarter, that kind of made sense, you know, because, you know, it, it, you sort of could, could work with that um, schedule-wise and everything. Sometimes there was a, maybe a unification going on and then the, the champion couldn't fulfill the mandatory. So, okay, you, you, give him the, you give this guy a chance to win the interim title. And then in six months, when the, the champion has fulfilled his obligation to, for more money, they can fight each other. But in boxing, of course, we talk about all the black eyes. Well, one of the black eyes is they make interim titles like crazy now. And they just, guys just keep them for years. It just became a separate sanctioning fee you pay at, uh, for a different belt, you know? So that, that's out the window. Um, so I, I think when it, when it comes to, to this, I mean, you could easily make the, the fights f for vacant titles or a title gets stripped and you make the next two available contenders fight for it. Um, I mean, at this point, what would have been the difference? You made Ennis already wait two, three more years than he should have for the title. What would have been the difference if you say, okay, you put him in a vacant world title fight. You strip Crawford if, that was, if that's what you got to do. And, and, and you strip him and, and you make Ennis fight the next available contender for the IBF title. I mean, what, what would it have cost you? You know what I'm saying? I, I know, you know, okay, Ennis doesn't deserve to wait. But you made the guy wait all these years already. So, you know what, give him the satisfaction to possibly be able to win the fight in the ring. You know, but... Again, then that comes down to who would buy that fight, who the next available contender is, and you'd have to, uh, you know, there'd have to be enough money for that kind of fight, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I don't know, man. It's, it's, third, it's disturbing, but again, you, you start to sort of go down that rabbit hole where the business becomes more and more complicated, and then you, you, you want to do the right thing by the sport, but then you see the business just sort of constantly, constantly gets in the way. I mean, Teddy was talking about Pete Rose and, and the Hall of Fame, um, you know, and, and, and the fact that, I, you know, he believes he should be in the Hall of Fame. I believe Pete, Pete Rose should be in the Hall of Fame, too, but I understand completely where that integrity comes from uh, and the fact that, you know, if, if, you give, if you allow this, the integrity of the entire sport now gets jeopardized, right? Well, boxing doesn't have that problem because boxing already has no integrity. So you got guys mm -hmm. in boxing, for example, that are first ballot Hall of Famers that have failed steroid tests in their career, you know, and then, then there's no penalty. Like, guys, you got Barry Bonds who still can't get in the Hall of Fame in baseball, you know what I mean? But for, for, Clemens, for the steroids, so Roger Clemens, Mark McGuire. Right, but, but in boxing, Boxing, there's no waiting period. You got first battle Hall of Fame as a failed steroid test, you know? So, so, so right. you know, uh, it, we, we, what are we talking about? The, the, the words integrity and boxing are, are almost like an, an oxymoron, you know? I, I, um, I, I remember saying this in my post-fight press conference when I fought Juan Diaz in Texas, um, where um, Oscar De La Hoya f spoke before me, and he was Juan's promoter, and he was saying, and even he was defending the, the uh, talking about how the decision, you know, we, you know, the, we got to save the integrity of boxing and all this other stuff. And I was like, well, what integrity, bro? What are we even told? What are we having this conversation about? What, what, what is it? Boxing has no integrity. It, has, has, it hasn't had it. I don't know if it ever did have it. I don't know. It hasn't had it in my lifetime. So, you know, it's an entertaining sport. Um, but the no, business, no, the, the sport, the boxing don't have it. You guys have it. Yeah. That's where the integrity, and that's, that's what I the said. truth. That, that, yeah. I'm not playing anybody. I'd say what I believe. That's where the integrity starts and ends with the fighters, period. And that's a problem because the sport should share some of that integrity. But that's my piece. Chris. Yeah, like, like I said, I mean, we, the integrity is in the gym. The integrity is in the ring. And as much as we bleed, it's not, it's not bleeding out into the rest of the sport, like you said, Teddy. And, um, Paul, I mean, it's funny. You, you mentioned like trying to say it's an oxymoron that integrity in boxing. It's true. It's known as the, is a dirty business. And that's, that's, I mean, that we, we talked about the best boxing movies, you know, in our last sparring session. And that was, that was one of the major key points to every boxing movie is how dirty the actual business is. And so one of the famous writer once said it's the red light district of sports. Mm -hmm. Boom. Perfectly put. I mean, I always say it's the best it's the best sport in the world. Boxing is the best sport in the world. It is the absolute worst business because there is no oversight. There is no protection for us fighters. There's no protection for anybody. I mean, just the guys at the top. And uh, I've mentioned, you know, it's a tyranny. 
But another another point that you had mentioned, George, not only did Paulie and I fight to win our world titles, we fought defending world champions. We didn't fight for a vacant title with some random contender, top number one guy from some defunct organization who's, you know, 20 and 0 and fought nobody from Timbuktu. You know, we fought real guys who were defending their titles. This whole email champion thing is disgusting. It, it really, it, it bothers me to my core. You have to fight. This is boxing. You have to fight. And the fighters want to fight. We want to fight each other, which also pisses me off when people are like, oh, he's, he's ducking this guy. He's afraid to fight. No, we're not afraid to fight. We need big fights. We need big fights to make money. We need big fights to get title fight shots. Yeah, we want to fight. We want to fight the best guys. We just want to get paid what we deserve. That's really what the difference is. But when it comes to the email champion thing, you, Paul, you made a great point. Why does it matter? Why does Ennis get this belt in the mail? He's going to fight. He's going to, well, I guess it'll be a defense. He's going to defend the title that he was just gifted in the mail. What's the difference? They're making their, their, their sanction fee either way. They're making their sanction fee in his next fight. So whether they strip them and then fight for the title and it's a vacant title and he fights for it and it gets his first crack at it, or if he has the title and is defending, it doesn't make a difference to them. It shouldn't. Now, I, I, I don't understand it either. It, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, who knows what, what, what the real issue is. And George, you said it before, we don't blame the fighters and not blame the fighters. It's not Boots Ennis's fault. Um, it's just, you know, the opportunity that that's presented to him. It is what it is, but I, I know him as a fighter. He wants to fight. He wants to win. He wants an epic night. Dude, that, that thing back there, that was an epic night for me. I will mm -hmm. never forget that. And I didn't get it in the mail. I, I want to fight. I beat a champion. So you're taking things away from guys and their careers and their legacies by doing stuff like this. And not only does it hurt the sport and whole, it hurts the individual. You know, I feel bad for Boots Ennis because he, d he doesn't have that opportunity to win that title the way I did and the way Paulie did. Make sure you download the app, click on the link, become a part of these shows, probox.com, your boxing channel. Teddy, um, the, the last uh, story I want to touch on uh, last weekend the great James Tony, Hall of Famer James Tony, faced off with Razor Ruddock. It was a six-round exhibition fight. It was somewhere in Jamaica. It was a pay-per-view that Triller did. Uh, Ruddock is 59 years old. James Tony is 55. And they were in the ring and they were fighting. Um, I didn't. I, I. I don't see how it's defensible in any way. But I wanted to go around the horn and, and get all three of your thoughts on the spectacle in Jamaica, starting with you, Teddy. That's the problem. You have no national commission. You have no oversight, and there's no regulation. There's nobody to say right or wrong. You can't do this. This is wrong. This is dangerous. This is unethical. Um, you know, this, you know, to Chris's point, he made a hell of a point. We talk about sometimes the things that are easy to talk about, the money, the, you know, the surface things, the peripheral things, important things, don't get me wrong. But what about the most important thing. What about the soul of a person? Mm. What about that? When you damage that, there's, a, there's no place, there's no repair place to go to fix it. I don't know of any. I mean, you know, you could you, you could lose money and you could go somewhere and you could get more money. But how do you get more of yourself when you lose that? And to that point that Chris brought up, and it, it had me thinking right away, and then you went into this, these people got already lost. These two fighters already lost a lot of themselves physically. Let's be honest. In the ring, they've they've lost, and they're old. They're sixty years old. You know, everyone deteriorates when they get older physically. But now you want to take away this from them, their soul, the spirit that allows them to be who they are, their dignity. You want to start to invade that, because that's what you're doing. Whether you, whether you want to be honest about it or that deep about it, because these people aren't deep. It's all about making a quick dollar. Let's be, let's be completely frank here. That's why I don't even know who pays for that. Maybe those people should think about it a little bit. I know you have the choice of doing whatever you want. I get it. I'm not judging anyone, but <laughs> maybe you should just think about it because what's that old saying? If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So mm. I, I definitely don't want people complaining about it if they want, if they went and bought it. Definitely don't want that. But to, again, to the to your point and to the point, um, there, there's people can be great, and people can be a lot less than great, and that's what you're seeing here, and and that's why you know 
when we raise children, there's got to be rules. Parents have to be in charge because sometimes they're, they're, if there's no boundaries, they'll, they go off into the wrong places. So you have to have boundaries. You have to have somebody in control, somebody in charge to say, that's not right. Can't do that. It's, it's not good. And we don't have that parent, if you want, in boxing to, to say, no, no, that, that, that can't be done. We, we won't license that. You know, I, I'd like to know. I, I don't. I guess it wasn't licensed. It's an exhibit. I don't know what it was, but it's a travesty. I know that much. It's a travesty. And what are they going to wait for? And I'll finish with this, and it's very powerful, and a lot of people won't like it, but that will be the first time they didn't like something that came out of my mouth. <laughs> what are they waiting for? So they wind up actually producing a real-life snuff film? Mm. Is that no? Is that what they're waiting for? Because right. that's coming eventually if they keep going down this road. That's something they should think about when they take when they go and they take their pieces of silver for doing this. That's all I have to say, Polly. Yeah, I mean it's it's a situation where. I, first of all, I, I don't understand how th this can monetize. I I do try to look at the I, I do look at the other side of it, right? I do look at the other side of it. Where do these guys? How badly? Well, they, can they, I jump in and say one ahead. other thing? Go ahead, of course, Teddy. And and uh, thank you. And it's one thing I got in, like into this place, and I I left out one thing. If we ever got the commission, the one that I'm trying to propose to go to, one of the many things besides you know better, you know, uh, actually accountability for judging and, you know, bad judging and all of those things that are a problem in our business, you know, um, and, and rating fighters properly and all the things we already talked about. Besides that, one of the items, and I think it might be the most important item, and it definitely is the most important item to touch on as we're talking about this particular thing right now, and that would be to get a pension for fighters. To actually get a, it could be done. I know it's tough. We have no infrastructure to do it right now. That's where a national commission would put that infrastructure. In but all you would have to do is tax the mega fights, the mega promotions, and there's enough of them during the course of a year, 2%, 2.5%. And you'd have a pool of money to actually start a pension. Then you figure out what the rules of that pension would be you know, how many pro fights they had to have, you know, when they start getting the pension. But that would alleviate, I think, these kind of nights, or at least remove most of these kind of nights where the fighter would not be in a position to have to do this because he would have a pension. They're doing this out of depravity. They're doing this out of economics. They're doing this. I mean, that's a big part of it. Uh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say I'll that. tell you, you're right. And, and they are doing it out of... I mean, I, I try to think of this, right? I mean, there's there's a point in my career where early in my career, I was hurting my hands so many times that I was like literally running out of money, you know? And at that point, at that point, when you have nothing coming in and you keep having debts to pay, even a few thousand dollars is oxygen. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like to us right now, Okay, we're looking at a couple of thousand dollars and like, is that worth it? I mean, these guys embarrassing themselves and and, and 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 doing all that. I mean, that's terrible. That's 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 a black eye for boxing. That's we shouldn't allow them to do that. From their perspective, I mean, I don't think they're very well off. Teddy's point comes across very well, of course, with the pension because these two guys were named guys. I think a pension would have to have be restricted to at least having become some sort of named guy in the business or in the sport. So these guys would probably qualify if there was a pension, right? So maybe they wouldn't need to uh, do this for this quote-unquote oxygen, right? It's, it's sort of being stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? Because for one perspective, you hate to see these guys have to go through this. But if they're in the street, or if they lead it that badly, it's something that they can, you know, make money with. You know, when you need oxygen that badly, mm. I mean, you're you're almost That's a good point. You know, you know, you'd rather do that than not do anything, not be able to do anything to to provide that quote unquote oxygen. 
it's uh again it's a it's a rock and a hard place kind of situation you know and, and it comes down to just like with the previous situation with Ennis had the right thing been done the wrong thing wouldn't have to be done now same thing here if the right thing was done earlier whereas name fighters should be able to qualify for these pensions then the wrong thing wouldn't have to be done now which is now these old name fighters have to get in the ring and fight for this uh you know for a couple of bucks and again I mean that, that couple of bucks how much oxygen is it but when you're broke when you have nothing even a little bit is still something to you it, it means a lot to you you know and um that's uh you know that's the perspective i i try to look at it too you know um uh by stopping this because there is no pension by if we if we stop this are we hurting these guys ability to make money and hurting their their life more or or do they want to live do they want to live on their uh live on their knees or die on their feet you know what i'm saying like mm. if you're uh, if you have nothing and you can't provide nothing are you going to be willing you're willing to have you're forced to live on your knees or if you're able to fight at 60 years old despite being broke despite not having with it at least you give yourself a little bit more quality i don't know I, again this all comes back down from the problem before this which is there is no pension there is no fund there is nobody helping these fighters and because you have this problem, I'm trying to think of the solution in this situation. And in this situation, I don't know what's right, man. I, I really don't. I don't know if, 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 if forcing these guys to live on their knees is right. You know, where they, they're, where they can't go make those couple of bucks. I don't know. Well, the, I, force, the word force is right because they don't, uh, they don't want to be in this position. But they are in this position for the myriad of reasons that you just said and we just talked about. But... Uh, before it goes to Chris, I'll leave with this. Um, do they want the last image of themselves to be this? That, that's that's a part that has to be equated into this a little bit. Uh, do, do they want... I, I They're not thinking about that right now because they're in a desperate place, probably, as you said very well and clearly. And again, the key here is they, they don't wish they were in this position to have to do this at 60, 50, whatever they are. But not that they've thought this out, but do they, do any of us want that to be, I mean, they were they were really good fighters. And Tony was a great fighter. Do yeah. they want this to be the last image of them in the ring? I, mean, I don't, I think, I, I think, I think that goes to your point, Paul. When you're underwater, when you're drowning, you don't care how you look when you get out of that water. You just want no. to get out. And when you when you're when Great you're point. grasping for air and like you said that, that even a thousand bucks. I listen, I, you, Paul, you mentioned them being financially broke and then Teddy made a great point earlier about the soul of the fighter. Some of these guys are spiritually some of us when we leave this sport are spiritually broke too. Not not just financially broke. These guys get an opportunity, and I don't, I don't know. I don't think I don't really question why they each other are doing it. Obviously, there's there's some money involved, but also also they get to relive a little bit of what they used to be, and they haven't been that for for many years. They get to walk the walk. They get to have people around. They get to be in a ring in front of a bunch of people. They get to punch another guy in the face. Listen, we we all love that. We miss that. We will never not miss that. Um, so the, you know the, there is that too. And I'm I'm with you, Paul. I'm torn about the whole thing, um, in terms of do we allow these guys to do that? I mean, you're you're a man. You can make any decision you want. And if it's going to put some extra money in your pocket or some kind of money in your pocket, and you're going to get that little tingle again, you get to go back in the ring and fight something. It, it's on you. Um, but if they didn't have to financially, I think it would be a different situation. I think that's what we're all talking about. And it's funny, man. We, we're talking about all of this stuff, and a lot of it ties together with all the points that we're making. It all trickles down from the top, man. The, the, the top is in control of a lot of things that that hurt this sport. And when you hurt the sport, you hurt the, the individual fighters. And and this is a, 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 I think this is a perfect end to what we've been talking about in terms of, you know, these things that are going on here with these young champions and these young future champions these young fighters now we go all the way down this is how this ends this ends with the guys like ruddick and tony um uh, out there you know like you said teddy you know tarnishing what, what fans are going to remember them for um fighting for probably not a lot of money 
I don't know. I don't. I don't know the answer either, champ. You, you put it. You. You. Yep. you, and, you and, guys, thank you guys. And, you guys and, opened my eyes a lot about and, this and, too. And you guys are both. You guys both made some really good points. Because Teddy, you made a great point about you don't want your last image. The last image of you being like that. But then Chris, you you actually made a good point too. Where <laughs> when you're drowning, you don't care how you look when you come out, as long as you you don't drown, right? right? And I I, I think of situations when when I was young, right? And I saw these guys sort of um, these kind of guys when I first started seeing these kind of problems. And again, I, I, I didn't know what to think. You know, I, I can remember the first one, George, you worked on the Legendary Night series, uh, selling Meldrick Taylor um, and, and mm -hmm. after the Chavez uh, fights and then later on in his career. And it shows uh, Dr. Margaret Goodman talking about how Meldrick shouldn't be fighting. And, he, and you hear him talking in the interview and you can't even understand him, you know. And, and um, I can remember, you know, thinking even back then, something like Teddy was saying, like, you know, the image you have of Meldrick Taylor is, is, is you know, so many positive things. Gold medal is 17 years old, multiple weight world champion. But is that how I want to remember him? It's, it's like it really, it, it bothered me to see that, you know? Um, I can remember being an amateur at the Under-19 Championships um, in the late 90s. And they were talking about how if you won the Under-19 Championships, you go to the World uh, Amateur Under-19 Championships. And they said the last American World Amateur 19 champion had been Carl Daniels. And I, I never know who Carl Daniels was, you know? Like, I, so there's no internet at that time or anything, you know? And then years later, I'm at a, I'm at a big card, and on a deep, deep undercard, Carl Daniels is getting knocked out by, in one round, and he's got like almost 20 losses, you know what I'm saying? And, he, and as a pro, he had become the WBA Junior Middleweight Champion, I think, you know? So I was like, dude, this is crazy, you know what I mean? Like, this so... So there has to be, between this and this, there has to be some kind of solution. There's so much in between there. If a fighter makes a certain amount of money, there's so much in between there. But there has to be people that care enough to do it. Because the fighters, we all, not, well, not all of us, because Chris is very, very educated scholastically. For the most part, though, a lot of fighters come from nothing. And nothing means no education as well. They don't understand how to handle money. You know what I mean? And you got these, you know, the, you, you, you got these ballers all over the internet that influence you to, oh, I, mean, I got to spend money on this. I got to spend money on that. Nobody really understands the finances. And it's hard. It's becoming a harder and harder world to understand finances. So it is, you got fighters that don't make enough money. Then you got fighters that make the money that don't know how to handle the money. It's got to be something. It's got to be something. We're going to sit here talking about it until we turn Bill in the face, but are they really going to solve it? I don't see it getting solved. Well, ho hopefully through talking about it and through action like Teddy, I know you're taking action. Hopefully the, the sport will will change. Well, make sure you download the app because you get real talk like this, and this is an unfortunate side of boxing, but it's a real side of boxing, and we talk about that on Pro Box too. So click on the link, download the app, become a part of the Pro Box TV family. Gentlemen, I thank you. And make sure you know that Pro Box TV is your boxing channel.